For many of you, you've felt that physical separation from your family. And one of the things that my, my mom, who, who lives a little bit of a distance from us, has tried to do and has been present in the life of my one-year-old. And um, throughout my daughter's life, uh, you know, my mom loves sending gifts. And so um, she recently uh, had sent Henry a gift of toys, and he's already kind of making the vroom vroom sounds. And, and so she was like, I'm so excited. So we get this Amazon package in the mail, and um, we go to FaceTime her so that she can see him open it. And, um, and when, she opens, when he opens it up and we hold it up to the camera, we're like, look, Henry, yo, this is so exciting. My mom's like, oh, that's weird. I thought it was going to be bigger. And I was like, what do you mean? She was like, well, the picture, it looked bigger. And, and so when I looked at the box, I realized that it actually did look significantly bigger, that what I could hold in my hand on the box looked like a small toddler was literally picking up with both arms and it was covering half of his body. And my mom was like, oh, I got it for him because I thought it was going to be this really fun, large toy. And so um, because it's COVID-19 and because why not, I decided to figure out the math of like, how big is this child in real life to hold this in both of his arms for it to be kind of proportionately the right size. And what I was able to deduce scientifically, mathematically, is that this child picture on the box that was prominent on display in Amazon is seven inches tall. Um, In fact, this is not a human child. This is some hobbit toddler, I'm assuming. I, I don't really know what hobbit toddlers look like, but whatever it is, whatever has a toddler seven inches tall is exactly what we're looking at on that box. And what's ironic and slightly funny is that the same tendency with toys on Amazon is the same tendency uh, that we get tricked on with travel sites. It's the same that we get tricked on Airbnb where it looks amazing and the water is blue and there's nobody around and you're like, yes, I can go there because I can be physically distant from people. And then you arrive and everyone is there too. And they didn't show you the pictures that were real. They'd cropped them to make it look like it was empty or they cropped it to make it look like the pool was massive. Or maybe it's in dating profiles where they looked a little different or their profile, you know, had some slightly different words. We see this in real estate, right? When you see the word quaint or charming or cozy, Those are polite ways of saying other things that maybe we don't necessarily like. But see, I think underneath these moments, those specific moments that I just shared, there's actually a bigger moment that's behind all of those moments. And it's that moment that I want to look at today as we continue our series, You're Not Far. You see, if we're going to move forward into a life of better decisions, fewer regrets, if we're going to move forward, forward into a fall where we're not controlled by the circumstances that we find ourselves in, I think we have to deal with one moment that's underneath all these other moments that can prevent us from moving forward. It's a passage of scripture that arguably may be one of the most famous passages in the entire Bible. It's also the oldest story ever told in humanity. It's a story that, um, For all of our familiarity, we still have some confusion around it. And what I want to do today with the the scope of what I'm going to do in this message is kind of look at that one moment that's behind all these other moments where we're duped and tricked so that we can find a way to move forward into a a future, into a fall filled with better decisions and fewer regrets. Um, If you have the Encounter Church app and you're watching this or listening to it, um, you can click on Encounter Church app. I've already loaded the text for today along with some, uh, some reflection questions. Um, if not, I'm going to be reading it. It says in Genesis 3, verse 1, this is what's theologically been called the fall, right? So this significant, one of the most significant moments in um, kind of Christian theology and Jewish theology. It says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the other wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Now, let me hit pause. He being the serpent. Now, that's strange. Okay, first of all, it violates the number one rule I have for my life and that I've tried to pass on to my children, which is if you encounter a talking snake, you run, 
right? You don't have a conversation. You check out. You get out. In fact, you don't even need the snake to talk to you in order to get away from it. In fact, we were hiking, which remember in our family is just walking outside. We were hiking um, this summer, and we actually had a snake go across the path. And my daughter, because I'm so proud of her because she's internalized our number one family rule, she straight up did a world record vertical jump and leapt onto my shoulders. And so, one... She's got Olympic potential, just requires snakes being present all the time. And two, I'm like, she internalized our family's rule. You see, this is strange that a a snake slithers up to someone and talks. And it's stranger that she talks back. And I recognize for some of us, especially if we're on the journey or we're exploring Christianity, this is one of those moments where we just kind of want to throw the flag and say, yep, this is weird. This is why. I, I, this is why I can't get in, I can't drink your Kool-Aid, you weirdo, right? Like, and I get it. And I want to just briefly touch on this because this is not a message where I want to um, spend the next 20 minutes unpacking the authenticity and the historicity of Genesis and why you can be confident in this as both an, like an archaeologically accurate and historical text as, as well as kind of a, a spiritual guide. But let me just kind of help you frame it enough so that we can move through it so you can get the bigger point that... that that will hit you in your life regardless if you don't agree with this moment. And it's that Genesis opens up with the creation of the universe and with Adam and Eve placed in the garden, this um, place of paradise that had been created for humanity. Now, I think Genesis 3 is one of the most, um, st- it's one of the most verifiable stories, not so much because of what we're about to see, but because of how we see it play out in our life regularly. But remember that they're placed in a garden, and one of the things that's unique about this garden at this period of time is that there isn't a separation between God and man. There isn't a separation between humanity and their creator. And so we find in Genesis chapter 2 that God walks and talks with them, that he comes into the garden to visit with them, that God is present on earth. That, you know, it's been said, G.K. Chesterton said you could... You can look at the world and you can draw a few different conclusions. One, you can look at the world and say there, um, there is no God because look at this world. There's another conclusion that you can draw too, though. You can look at this world and say if there is a God, there must be something that separated God from us because there's so much beauty, but there's so much brokenness too. I see both the rumors of heaven and hell when I walk on these streets. And so I, I would argue that... Um, You've you got a little bit of our frame of mind seeing the world the way it is now looking back. But if you happen to be in a garden and you had conversations with God, a talking snake isn't that strange. Definitely strange to you and me, not that strange to her. Um, do I know if other animals talk? No clue. I'm pretty sure that there are a lot of little children all around this world that secretly wished all the animals talk because their television shows show them talking. And so, like... If you want to know a little bit more of why I can be confident in the text that I'm actually going to be talking through the day, again, I want to honor our time. Um, I don't have time to press into that right now, but I have given you this number recently, 617-415-4441. If you text that number or if you've already texted that number and filled out a profile, this week I'm going to send out a video, just a short one. It's not going to be a history lesson, but I'll give you a three-minute video on why I'm confident that Adam and Eve were real people And that the Garden of Eden and what we see around it as the creation story is actually something that you and I, both as thinking, scientifically minded individuals, can put our confidence in. So, again, 617-415-4441 if you want to learn why I'm confident that Genesis 1, 2, and 3 are trustworthy. Um, But for today, I just want us to deal with the fact that this woman and this man, Adam and Eve, saw God, talked with God, so the snake didn't really creep them out as much as it would you and me. So the snake says, did God really say you must not eat from the tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden and you must not touch it or you will die. Well, you will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, Your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. 
When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some of it and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it too. Now, what we've seen play out in these six verses is quite arguably the most famous story in planet Earth and certainly the oldest story on planet Earth. And what plays out in this very ancient story is something that you and I see play out all the time. Whether it's on Amazon and what we buy, whether it's on some website and the place that we book, or a real estate agent selling us a website, I mean, selling us a home through a website, the reality is that you and I bump up against deception all the time. And one of the most powerful deceptive tools, whether um, we're so good at it, right, that this is how we fish. What do we do? We trick a fish into thinking there's something worth grabbing a hold of, and then we reel them in, right? And so we are so good at deception, and we're so good at practicing deception because we do it to ourselves all the time. And what you actually see play out in this story, I think, is the biggest barrier you and I have in moving forward and having better decisions and fewer regrets. And it's learning to overcome the deception that the person in the mirror throws at you quite regularly. Now, the problem with self-deception is how do you know you're being deceived? It's a lot like the wind, right? You can't grab the wind, you can't see the wind, but you can see its impacts, You can see its influence. And I would argue that in this passage, you can actually see some of the impact of self-deception playing out in slow motion. And these practices, this pattern of self-deception is actually not unique to Adam and Eve and a talking serpent. It's actually the way you and I talk to ourselves all the times when we find ourselves in these moments where we regret them. In fact, I would probably argue that the biggest danger you and I have in moving forward isn't COVID-19. It isn't um, what's playing out in school systems and virtual schooling or even some of the unemployment challenges. All of those are valid challenges. All of them are big barriers. But the biggest barrier, the, the greatest block to our future oftentimes is us. In fact, I don't have to know your story that know that most of you, not all of you, but most of your stories, your biggest regrets, your wishes you could redo moments were things that you said, things that you did, people that you dated, people in places that you went to, right? You drank it, you smoke it, you signed up for it, you applied for it, right? Then the common commonality is you and me. And so how do we overcome what all of us thought in the moment was such a good idea that ends up causing us to be filled with grief? Well, one, I think we go back to the story and we see in slow motion what plays out. Well, what happens early on is Eve's presented with a different way of thinking and seeing her scenario. She's in the middle of the garden of Eden. I don't know geographically how big that garden was, but based on the descriptors in Genesis chapter 2, we know that the garden is significant enough for it to support multiple rivers. And multiple rivers are, I'm just guessing, but I'm thinking a place that can support multiple rivers is probably a little bit more vast than I can just walk in a day or so. And so here's a massive garden filled with trees of all kinds of fruit. This is there are no mosquitoes. There are no rotten fruit. I, I, you know, the, we're not yet predators and kind of like carnivores. So I like to imagine in this garden, there was the orange, which was really very uncreatively named. And then you probably have fruit that maybe tasted like steak, right? Or tasted like Italian, some type of chicken dish. Right? Because we're not yet eating little tiny birds that run around that can't fly. And we're not yet um, eating creatures that chew grass and produce milk. Um, right? So we're not in that world yet. So the fruit has to be completely sufficient for both pleasure and for sustenance. And so I just like to imagine that there is the medium rear steak tree and there is the, you know, like the grilled out chicken steak tree. Like, I mean, like it's just... It's an awesome place to be. But what happens in the dialogue is that from the garden with all of these trees, her focus and attention turns 
to one tree. And see, here's one of the things that happens when we start to fall into the trap of self-deception. You start to focus on what you will gain and not what you will lose. You only see what you will gain, not what you'll lose. That text message when you're flirting or that person who's not your spouse, all you see is what you will gain, not what you'll lose. That business decision that requires you to kind of bend some rules and kind of skirt some some things because there's some insider information, you only see what you'll gain, not what you'll lose. Not just the criminality, but the lack of respect that you will have from your peers when it finally comes out. Right? We focus on what we will gain, not what we lose. And that's exactly where Eve is. She doesn't see the garden. She doesn't see any of the other trees. All she sees is this one tree. And she doesn't recognize what she'll lose. This is one of the first things that you and I begin to fall in. We develop a tunnel vision and all the other good things in our lives, the relationships that we have, the, right, all those things start to disappear. And all we see is the glass and the promise of escape from pain that it brings. Or we see that one purchase and all we see is how good it's going to make us feel when we get to, to put those shoes on or get that next device. We don't look at the financial hit. We don't look at the credit card bill. We don't look at the relational impact. We just see what we're going to gain, not what we'll lose. And then the other piece that you notice is that your words are filled with half-truths, not lies. And I actually think this is really important because... Oftentimes, when we think about self-deception, we think about lies. But I would actually argue, what you see in this passage, you go back and read it thoroughly, diligently, and what you'll find is that the snake never lies. We, we like to kind of, in the, the grand storytelling of this um, kind of moment, oftentimes the snake is painted as the grand liar. And yet, the snake... I believe, could go into court and could justifiably make a case that it never lied. It did something more dangerous. It just told half-truths. And half-truths are more dangerous than lies. Half-truths are the the mechanism for self-deception. It's what you don't say that would get in your way that often gets left out. Right? Well, I'm not respected, or they don't appreciate me. And we leave out the things that you've done to not be respected. We leave out the things that we have done to not be appreciated. We leave out the things that we've done in that relationship to damage it. Well, if she was more like this, or if she started treating me this way, then, you yeah, know, but we're leaving out all the stuff that we've done to contribute to it. It is not lies that fuel self-deception. It's half-truths. The snake cleverly gives enough half-truths to completely help guide Eve and Adam down a path of self-deception. One of the most powerful half-truths that oftentimes creep in is that this is a God thing. This is a good thing. Right? God, God wants you to be wise, He just doesn't want you to eat that fruit because if you ate that fruit, then you would be wise. You'd be like him. Wasn't that a good thing to be like him? Isn't it a good thing to to eat fruit so that you can live? Isn't it a good thing to be in a relationship where you're appreciated, where you're valued, where you're cherished? Isn't it a good thing to, to have, you know, stuff in life? That's the half truth. And what you see is, well, you can have all that, but you just need to go outside the guidelines and the barriers and the boundaries that God defined in His, in his Word or in Scripture. Whenever you're faced with a circumstance where you can have a good thing, but the only way you get that good thing is outside of God's way, you're probably in the territory of self-deception. If the only way you can get that good thing is to go around the boundaries and the guardrails God put in place, then you're probably in dangerous territory. And this is exactly 
where Eve finds herself. Right? In the last verse, in chapter 6, we see her say, she sees that the fruit is desirable. It's pleasing to the eye. It's good food. And, and this is not something that just Eve struggles with, right? I, I have a one-year-old I was telling you about earlier. Just yesterday, or this week specifically, um, he's discovered outlets. And he loves to walk up to an outlet, and especially when there's a plug, and he just wants to grab hold of it and yank it out. In fact, you know, my wife earlier this week was like, our printer's not working. It was because my son had went and just ripped out the printer outlet. And so we're sitting in the kitchen, and he walks in, and he walks over to the outlet, and he's about to grab it. And I'm like, Henry? No, no. And now, he does the strangest thing. I don't know if you've ever experienced this. He keeps moving forward. And then he turns around and looks at me like, I dare you, you chubby man. Stop me. Do something about it. And the entire time he's staring at me, his little tiny body is doing this. And I'm like, Henry? And he's like, what are you going to do? You going to stop me? And now, I never sat down with Henry and said, son, you've reached that vital age of eight months where I need to teach you an important life lesson. There's going to be a day where your father is going to look at you and your mother is going to look at you and they're going to say, Henry, don't do that. Henry, no. And when that day comes, son, I need you to rise up. I need you to stand up boldly and proudly and look us straight in the eye. And even though you don't have words, I want you to give us the biggest, most condescending glance you can muster. And I want you to say, stop me with your face. Boy, that'll make me proud if you do that, right? Like, none of us had to be sat down and taught that. I never had to sit down and teach my son that. And probably is no one had to sit you down and teach your kids or you that either. The reason you and I do that is the same reason Eve did it too. Something inside of us. Something inside of us likes to rebel. Something inside of us believes that what we want is more important than what the people around us say we should need. And, and it's actually something that has been documented. There's a famous test called the marshmallow test. And the marshmallow test was um, done about 30 or 40 years ago. Um, it could be off on a couple of those years. And the idea was to bring a kid in a room, and they were placed on a table. They were left by themselves, and they were told, here's one marshmallow, but if you wait, when I come back, I'll bring you two. And that they essentially recorded kids doing exactly what this kid was, which was living in torment. And some of them stuck the marshmallow in the mouth the moment the, the facilitator left the room. But the idea was if you waited, that when they came back, you would get two. Now, what made this study so significant and the reason that it became so famous was they actually tracked these kids into adulthood. And they found that the kids who waited, who ate both, marshmallows after waiting for the one well they had higher sat scores they were more successful in life all of these good things but the challenge was is that now that the test has been multiplied recreated replicated which is kind of a gold standard um, in psychological sociological testing and scientific method in general um, they, they started to discover it's not as reproducible as the first test and there's a lot of reasons we won't get into why the first test hasn't been easily as reproduced. But they've basically come to the conclusion now with multiple studies that it's not a great predictor of lifelong success. It turns out that oftentimes what putting a marshmallow in front of a kid and telling them not to eat it until they come back and then they can get two is a predictor of, is a predictor of how much a kid will wait to eat a marshmallow. But that's about as much as you can conclude. But there's actually been one particular finding that stayed consistent through the entire study that was in the first study, and it's continued to pop up. And I think it's actually that portion, that finding, that was sort of small in the study that's the most significant in what we see. You see, when the serpent comes and says, now the serpent was more crafty than any of the other wild animals the Lord God had made, he said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Now, if we continue to play out the story, 
there's a subtle shift in this story that is almost imperceptible, but would have screamed at the original readers and hearers of the story. They would have recognized in an instant what had happened. And it's exactly what they found in the marshmallow test. That one of the surest predictors that a kid would eat a marshmallow was whether or not they trusted the facilitator. If the kid did not trust the facilitator, the moment the facilitator walked out of the room, the kid ate the marshmallow. Why? Because I don't trust that you're going to bring back to, so I'm going to eat the one that I have. And that what we see in this story is it says, the woman said to the serpent, we must not eat fruit from the trees in the garden. But God did say, you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden. And it probably, did you see it? See, in Genesis chapter 2, one of the ways that we're introduced to God is not just in what he is as God, but who he is as Lord. This word here means master. It means the ruler, the, the one who is in control, the, the sovereign great king. This word Lord is a significant word that reflects not just what he is, but who he is. He's the creator, sustainer, the beginning, and the end. And when the serpent begins to talk, he doesn't say the Lord God, because for the serpent, God is not the Lord God. He's just God. It's just a what. It's not a who. There's no authority there for him. So that's why he says, did God. Now, Adam and Eve would have referred to God as Lord God. But notice what Eve does. She says, but God did say. And this is actually, I think, one of the most fundamental, insightful pieces and turns in this entire story. That if you're a Christian, that this is oftentimes where the battle actually begins against self-deception. It's an issue around trust. Do you trust the great facilitator? Do you trust the Lord God? Do you trust that He knows your needs? Do you trust that He sees you in your current circumstance and situation? Do you trust that He is for you and with you even when life seems to be against you? Or do you fall into the trap like Eve did in verse 6 where it says that she looked at the fruit and she saw that it was pleasing to the eye, it was good for food, and it was an avenue for gaining wisdom. Ultimately, what Eve did in that moment was her shift from trusting in God became a trusting in both the serpent, but really in herself. Her feelings, her eyes, what we would popularly call culturally of trusting her heart. Eve trusted her heart. And in the moment, what she was promised was to be shrewd. And what happened in the end was her and her husband were just standing there nude. Which was a Genesis way of saying shame, guilt, vulnerability, exposure, regret. See, this story isn't that distant from you and I. It's not that far away from us. Because in those moments when we choose to trust our heart and to go with our gut and to, to follow our eyes or our feelings, we end up in places that we never intended to go. We lose more than we ever intended to lose. Sometimes that loss is a relationship. Sometimes that loss is health. Sometimes that loss is respect from those who know you best. Sometimes that loss is financial. But we always end up losing more than we gain. And what we stand there filled with is shame, regret, disappointment, and a deep desire and longing that we could do a redo. And that the biggest battle that you and I as Christians have to face every single day is the issue around trust. Do we trust Him? Do we believe He's good? And for those who are 
listening today and they're in a journey, but they're not yet ready to say, you know, I want to be a Christian. I am a Christian. That oftentimes your biggest struggle isn't at that deeper trust level, which it may be. But most of your struggle is going to start a little bit higher up where you're going to be you're going to be battling yourself and that tendency towards self-deception and seeing what you're going to gain, but not what you'll lose of the tendency to to have a lot of half truths that make you feel even more confident in what you're about to do. And for all of us today, I want to leave you with a few questions. It, and these are meant to be for reflection. I know that there are some people today who are actually watching this service. They're engaging together um, in a small group like um, some of those who are going to be at the building and for some of you in sitting in living rooms. And so here's some questions that might kind of facilitate some of the questions that you already have or maybe you're sitting listening to this as a podcast during the week. These are questions that maybe you can ask in self-reflection. The first question is, you know, what are more dangerous, half-truths or lies, and why? Don't just take my word for it. I want you to wrestle with that. Because I think this is one of those components where we have to learn to recognize the half-truths. We have to learn to be able to see what's not being said. We have to be able to, to say, well, give me the rest of the story to our own selves. Is there any area where I need a reality check, not a rela- rationalization? If we had have stepped into that moment with Eve, I think we could have said, hey, Eve, time out. I know this fruit that you're about to bite, which, by the way, is not an apple. That's a Jeopardy thing. If you ever end up on Jeopardy, you can send me that and say thank you. Um, right? It, there's no apple mentioned in this story. Apple is some kind of medieval creation and some painting. It's a fruit. So I know you're about to eat that fruit, but hey, time out, time out. Look at all this other fruit. Look at all these other good things. Oh, by the way, when you eat that fruit, I need to let you know, like, let's jump in my time machine and show up in 2020. Um, you see all this divisiveness. You see the racial tensions. You see the, you see COVID-19. You see car keys. You see clothes. You see sickness. You see death. You see funerals. You see um, kind of relational struggle and strife. You see parents disconnected from their kids. All of that will flow out of this. You are going to gain a bite of fruit. And you will lose the world for generations to come. Reality check. Not rationalization. Because we are all really good at rationalizing, justifying, and half-truthing ourselves into some path that ultimately robs us of the future that you and I desire. And as the last thing, and this is for some of you where you are right now, whether it's through a glass that you hold every single night that that started off as one that's now become three or whether it's you know in you where you are financially or whatever but for some of us in the midst of it this simple question is what i'm doing worth what it is doing to me is what i'm doing worth what it is doing to me that's a question that i think you have to ask and out of that comes so many implications but if you're willing to take a step back this fall and look around. To not just see what you'll gain, but also be aware of what you might lose. To become cognizant of the half-truths that oftentimes justify and lead us into these paths of destruction. And are willing to maybe even ask some of these questions, ultimately driving to the heart of, do I trust that God is good, and that God is with me and God is for me? Then I think truly, you and I are not that far. From the future that you and I desire.